join me in welcoming Professor Nikolai Petrovsky. Thank you. So, good evening. Unfortunately, I should have asked her to write a longer bio so I, I can give a shorter talk, as Toby pointed out. So, Toby's obviously a very hard act to follow. And um, I started life uh, as, as an ambitious young endocrinologist um, wanting to cure type 1 diabetes and, and embarked on my PhD, which is now about 20 years ago. And at that time, you know, the, the worry as a student was not that we wouldn't find a cure, but the cure would be found before I actually finished my PhD, because every few weeks JDRF would run a big front page story of cure for diabetes found. Um, and it would either be stem cells or transplants, the sort of things we've heard about tonight. Um, now, that was 20 years ago. And so, obviously, you know, science... Um, can't be rushed. And so I, I don't say this in a negative sense um, because science ultimately finds the answer to everything. Um, but it can't be rushed. So we don't know whether it will deliver tomorrow. Um, and I think, you know, addressing some of the questions that have been asked, you know, when will this happen? The answer is no one knows. But all I know is if we stop doing the science and stop funding the science because we say, well, you promised us 20 years ago and we're still not there, so we want to put our money somewhere else, that is a big mistake. Because if we don't keep putting money into it, then, then we won't do the science and we won't find the solution. So, so don't give up hope, but at the same time, don't you know, give yourself a false sense of security that if you don't look after your diabetes, it doesn't matter because in the next five years or so, you'll be able to get an islet transplant, because I can pretty well guarantee that won't be happening. So, so don't give up hope, but, but don't give yourself false hope, um, and, and use the treatments we have appropriately, um, uh, and, uh, and wait, and, and science will ultimately deliver. So um, just a disclosure, I, I speak for various uh, companies, so uh, bear that in mind when you hear what I talk about today. I'm actually not going to talk about my, my 20 years of, of working in uh, autoimmune disease research, trying to develop cures or vaccines for type 1 diabetes. I actually decided today to do something a little different. Um, was to, to actually talk about the relationship between diet and diabetes. Now, now because today is, is focused on type 1 diabetes, I've spent 20 years giving dietary advice to, to people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, but in fact, when you think about it, and I'm going to show you some very interesting data today, um, in fact, diet may be equally, if not more relevant, in fact, to prevention of type 1 diabetes. And this is, uh, I'm going to be talking about prevention of type 1 diabetes. This is not diet once you have diabetes, it's can you use diet to prevent type 1 diabetes um, in, in children. Obviously, uh, uh, I, I sort of uh, giving this talk in the background of having done a lot of work in, in trying to regulate immune function, and I think Toby may have put out some false promise there that I was going to tell you more about that side of it. I've just got a few slides uh, on my perspectives on um, uh, uh, um, immunological treatment of, of type 1 diabetes. Um, as I said before, um, uh, I've done a lot of work in both type 2 and type 1 diabetes, but my, my, I guess the love uh, from my PhD is, is in type 1 diabetes and trying to understand why do people get type 1 diabetes? Why do some people get it and, and others don't? And uh, we can look at the differences in, uh, uh, between uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes and we can also look at the similarities and I think we can learn a lot from doing both of those things. But suffice to say, the, the big distinction between type 1 and type 2, uh, as Toby alluded to, is that people with type 1 diabetes destroy their beta cells, so they lose their ability to make insulin, um, whereas people with type 2 diabetes predominantly become resistant to insulin, although 
in the later stages of type 2 diabetes, there also is a loss of, of beta cells, but this isn't driven by the immune system attacking them so much as them sort of getting exhausted and, and just falling over, a bit like the beta cells in an islet transplant. As Tony mentioned, uh, Toby mentioned, a lot of them actually die uh, very soon after transplantation because it's just too stressful for them. And that's why beta cells die in people with type 2 diabetes. Um, even within type 1 diabetes, we talk about it as if it's a, a single disease. And, and if, in fact, if you start teasing it apart, it isn't a single disease. Uh, it's much more complex than that. Um, you have the people with the classical form of type 1 diabetes. These people have, have particular transplantation markers, uh, such as HLA, DR3 and DR4. Um, they have autoantibodies to, to insulin and, and other islet components in their blood that we can measure. They have a very classical uh, picture of immune destruction of, of the uh, beta cells. But, but in addition to this, a lot of people who are said to have type 1 diabetes don't fit this particular mould. Um, and, uh, and we just need to be aware of that because when we find a treatment say only helps half the people with type 1, it may be in fact because there's two different types of type 1 and the treatment is actually only helping one of those types. So it is important to recognise that this is not a homogeneous uh, disorder. And these are just some of the other forms of type 1 diabetes that we now recognise as being uh, different in their origins, some of these caused by uh, particular gene mutations. The other interesting thing about type 1 diabetes that tells us it's not a homogeneous uh, uh, or, or, or the same disease in everyone is this extraordinary difference in, in the incidence of type 1 diabetes um, in different countries of the world. Uh, and so what you'll see here um, is that Scandinavia, Finland, have the highest rate of type 1 diabetes of anywhere in the world. So um, uh, 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 that's not a good place to be born um, if you want to avoid type 1 diabetes. Um, conversely, um, you'll see a lot of countries around the equator um, uh, uh, have, have extraordinarily low rates of type 1 diabetes. Now, in some cases, this may be they just have badly developed medical systems and, and, and children with type 1 diabetes die before, before anyone works out what's wrong with them. But, but even in countries, uh, these countries which have very good medical systems, it, it is true that there are very low incidences of type 1 diabetes. So, so why is that? If it's the same disease, why do some countries have it and other countries don't? And it's, it's been a question that's intrigued us and, and driven a lot of our research over the last uh, 20 years. By the way, if you want to know where Australia is, we're about number five in the highest incidence. Um, so we're way up there just below Scandinavia uh, in, in terms of our uh, incidence of type 1 diabetes. So we are actually a high risk uh, uh, a place and I guess that's why we have such a, a strong audience tonight when we're talking about type 1 diabetes. Uh, again, I'm not going to go a lot into the, the uh, uh, I guess, immunological reasons why you, we get diabetes other than, than to say we know there is a genetic predisposition. It's not in, in necessarily an inherited genetic predisposition, unlike in type 2 diabetes, where if your parent has type 2, you're probably going to get type 2. Uh, in type 1, um, what we inherit are particular genes, but these are very common genes in the population. So by themselves, they don't cause us to get diabetes, but they do determine who's at, at higher risk or, or lower risk. Uh, but then something happens that triggers this immune system in these individuals to, to go wrong, and uh, at that point, the, the T cells in the, in the blood start attacking the beta cells, uh, and ultimately this results in type 1 diabetes. So, so there's a lot of research has gone on in the last 20 years to understand, you know, what is driving this process, and ideally, how do we switch it on uh, before the destruction occurs, and, and in that way, actually prevent type 1 diabetes at, at, at its, its very origins. Obviously, what Toby has talked about tonight is, is what do we do when someone actually has type 1? Can, can we actually revert things uh, back to normal? So I'm more interested in can we 
actually work out what causes type 1 and stop it before it starts. So to do that, we do a lot of work um, looking at, at, at how the immune system recognises and, and, and destroys the beta cells and the different pathways involved, which I'm not talking about. Um, but we know that there are a variety of molecules produced by the immune system that are toxic to the beta cell. And so we've looked at strategies of how to block some of these molecules. Again, part of the problem is some of these strategies are, are, are toxic in themselves. And there you, there you have the conundrum that maybe even if you could switch it off, the treatment would be more toxic than having type 1 diabetes. So, so this is a real challenge in the field. All right. So... so if we're going to prevent type 1 diabetes, you know, when and, and how do we have to do it? So the answer is probably very early in life. So although a lot of people don't get type 1 diabetes till they're in their teens, some people in their 20s, 30s, and the oldest patient I think I had presenting with new onset um, type 1 diabetes was in their 80s. So there's no actual age at which you can't get type 1 diabetes. Obviously, it's much more common in children but it can happen in 80 or 90 year olds. They just have a very slowly developing form of type 1. But when you do all the tests, it clearly is type 1 diabetes. Um, so there's no age at which you're completely protected. But, but what we know is that you can go into children um, and follow them from birth, you know, in these large population studies and start looking at what are the markers that develop before a child, well before a child gets type 1 diabetes? Are there markers in their blood that we can detect that would tell us which children will get type 1 diabetes uh, or, or not? And uh, these are uh, what we call the islet antibodies. So these are uh, markers in the blood that bind to insulin and, and other uh, proteins in the beta cells. And uh, so this is a, a, a study that was done from birth looking at, at a group of children who were born uh, in families where there was a lot of type 1 diabetes, so these children were at increased risk. And then they, they took blood samples from these children over time. Uh, and, and what you can see is that from about six months of age, uh, some of these children actually start to develop these antibodies in their blood. So the process that leads to type 1 diabetes in most individuals is starting in the first year of life, even if they don't get type 1 diabetes itself for another 20 years. So if we, again, if we're going to get in and we're going to stop type 1 diabetes, the pl best place to start is actually before this process starts. So we're really talking the first 6 to 12 months of life. Um, that's the challenge. And then the question is, well, what do we do to, um, you know, to switch off that process in very young babies? Now, what I said about adults and, and the treatments being toxic um, is even worse if you're looking at a newborn baby. You're not going to give it immunosuppression um, and, uh, or, or any of these other toxic treatments we, we've talked about that you may give someone who's having an islet transplant later in life. You, you, you can't do that to a baby. The risks are just way, way too high. Um, so, so even although there, there are a variety of immune pathways that you might target um, later in life, these are not really suitable for targeting in babies. So, so we have to find something different. Um, one of the models of type 1 diabetes, which is still a hypothesis, it hasn't been proven, is, is, is there a, does a virus get into the beta cells in these young children? Uh, and is that what's driving this immune process to destroy the beta cells? And again, there, you know, there's a lot of, of support for that, uh, circumstantial evidence. We haven't actually proved uh, that a virus is behind it, but we haven't proved a virus isn't behind it. Um, if it was a virus, well, then obviously the, the next question would be, you know, we'd need to develop a, a treatment targeting that virus. But, you know, we give children antibiotics, you know, we give uh, adults uh, with HIV and, and newborns with H uh, to mothers with HIV antiviral treatment, and we know that's safe. So if it was a virus, maybe that would be the answer, would be to treat them with an appropriate antiviral. But as I say, we still haven't, haven't confirmed that. Um, 
So, so one of the places to look, if you're looking for a, a, a way to modulate this disease process in newborns um, and to change the way their immune system functions, is to look at nutrition. Um, and this is really something that probably should have been looked at 40, 50 years ago, but it's funny how, you know, um, it, it really seems to be a new concept, this idea of modulating diet, um, both in mothers uh, as well as in their children, to change the risks of disease in those children when they grow up. When you think about it, it, it seems pretty self-obvious that what a mother eats influences potentially the way her baby develops in utero, uh, and then from what happens to the baby in utero, that may shape the way that baby grows up and the diseases the baby gets. Um, and that we now have very good understanding of the genetic basis for that, which is what we call epigenetics, which is that the old idea you're born with a set of genes that determines how you grow up is actually completely wrong. Um, that, in fact, the environment of the baby inside the mother, uh, you can act, the mother, it, mother's environment actually shapes the way which genes are switched on and which genes are switched off in her baby. So, so the genes of the mother aren't actually necessarily the way the genes are in the baby. Um, so, so we now understand that environment is, is at least as important as genetics in influencing how someone turns out as they go into adulthood. So hence what the mother eats and what the baby eats has a profound effect on, in fact, their genes. Um, and so when we look at type 1 diabetes, we can look at, are there any clues to the fact that diet might influence the risk of getting type 1 diabetes? And there's some really strong clues, and I think Jenny Cooper, who's speaking later, might in fact also be addressing some of this data. Um, one of the strongest pieces of data is that if a mother breastfeeds her child for 9 to 12 months, then it, it about halves the risk of that child getting type 1 diabetes uh, compared to children who have the same risk but whose mothers don't breed, uh, breastfeed them, uh, who, who switch them over to infant formula early. And it's, that's very solid data from all countries around the world. It's been replicated many times. So there's something about breastfeeding that's protective or cow's milk and early exposure to cow's milk uh, that's detrimental to children who are at potential risk of type 1 diabetes. There's some data, including um, uh, uh, Australian data, on the importance of vitamin D. So if you're vitamin D deficient or a baby is vitamin D deficient, then their immune function is, is dysfunctional, and this may, again, increase their risk. Uh, and certainly there's very good links between low vitamin D levels in Tasmania and the fact Tasmania has the highest rate of multiple sclerosis in Australia. So it seems to be a very close link. We haven't yet shown, of course, that supplementing vitamin D stops this. So it's an association we haven't proved um, that necessarily one is, is its cause and effect. But it's certainly very interesting. And of course, vitamin D is very non-toxic. Uh, doesn't hurt you to take a vitamin D supplement. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk mainly for the rest of my talk today about the idea that probiotics um, and what we call um, uh, inulin or, or what's called soluble dietary fibre can have a profound effect on risk of autoimmunity and, and type 1 diabetes. Uh, as well as being good for us for a whole lot of other reasons I'll go into, like reducing risk of bowel cancer. Um, and on the other side of the, the equation, we have the things in the diet that could be really bad and increase our risk. Um, and so these are things like nitroso compounds, so, so barbecued uh, meats and, and uh, uh, preserved uh, preservatives, uh, particularly preserved fish and smoked fish, um, uh, are bad. Uh, cow's early exposure to cow's milk appears to be bad. Um, potatoes may be bad because of the Melbourne group, uh, Paul Zimmert, showed a number of years ago that if potatoes have this particular fungus on them, which you can't see, it produces a toxin that's very toxic to beta cells. So he put up this idea that maybe this is driving uh, uh, some of the, the beta cell damage that causes type 1 diabetes. 
And then another Melbourne group, my old boss, uh, Len Harrison, postulated that one of the reasons we're seeing more uh, type 1 diabetes in children uh, is that there's more childhood obesity. And so he came up with this accelerator hypothesis suggesting that if, you get, if a child gets overweight, it actually puts more stress on the beta cells and therefore they're more likely to be destroyed. In fact, data we've generated recently actually suggests this isn't true and ironically, a, a bit of childhood obesity, at least in animal models, may actually protect against autoimmune beta cell destruction. So, so that still needs to be uh, resolved. In terms of clinical trials in type 1 diabetes, so some of the bodies that uh, Toby Coates has been involved in uh, uh, over the last 20 years have, have spent uh, probably, I don't know, five, ten billion dollars to date. Um, <laughs> doing all of these trials of a whole lot of different, uh, mainly immunomodulatory treatments um, uh, to try and prevent type 1 diabetes in people who've recently developed it. Um, and all I can say is to date, essentially, all of these trials have failed. So um, we still don't have that magic um, bullet. And, and needless to say, a lot of these treatments did prove to be very toxic. Um, so even if they had worked, there'd still be a question mark, but the fact is, uh, for them, by and large, um, they haven't worked. Um, so so uh, another way is to go into to people before they develop type 1 diabetes, as I said, children at risk of type 1 diabetes early in life. Uh, and to do this, you have to, obviously, you can't give them toxic things. You have to try more, more subtle interventions, uh, as listed here, um, and uh, uh, again, um, some of these studies are ongoing, like uh, TIGA, which I think there's a centre in Westmead, which is a cow's milk protein avoidance program in, in young children from birth um, to try and see if you avoid cow's milk, whether this will reduce the risk of type 1 diabetes. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is this idea of actually more dietary fibre um, and uh, probiotics may actually, by changing the gut environment in young babies, um, uh, modulate their immune systems and thereby actually um, stop them developing autoimmunity. Uh, so, so what I'm going to be talking about a lot today is dietary uh, fibre or soluble fibre. A lot of people don't understand what that means. They think of fibre as, as being bran. Um, but in fact, uh, uh, what we're talking about um, today is um, a, a basically a plant-based sugar, and uh, it looks like sugar. So, so this is it. As you can see, it doesn't look any different to table sugar. Um, I've got some samples here. You know, you get it in sachets. You put it in a drink. Uh, it dissolves, so just like sugar does. But the interesting thing is, unlike sugar, um, it doesn't get absorbed. So it's magic. Uh, the magic is that the sugar molecules are all linked together in a long chain. And because of this, the, the long chain of sugars can't get absorbed through the bowel wall. So it stays inside the bowel. So even though it's sugar, it's, it, it doesn't have any calories for you because you can't absorb it. Um, and, uh, and what happens to this sugar um, in, in the body is because you can't absorb it, it actually acts as a foodstuff for lactobacilli. Now, lactobacilli you'll know of as, as probiotics, um, like you cult. Um, so these are good gut bacteria. And it turns out that the only bacteria that can eat inulin are the good ones. Um, so, so lactobacilli and, and bacteroides, which are the two um, major uh, bacteria uh, in, in yogurt, um, those bacteria are especially designed so that they can eat inulin. So the E. coli and all the bad gut bacteria starve to death. If you had a diet of inulin, you would have lots of lactobacilli in your gut and all the bad bacteria basically die of starvation. Those bad gut bacteria love sugar and, and they love starch. That's what, in an evolutionary sense, they've designed. Now, you could argue that one of the reasons people get fat is not because they want to eat too much, but the gut, bad gut bacteria want you to eat starch. And so it turns out they control you um, 
uh, a bit like a pet who wants to be fed all the time, who starts manipulating your behaviour. What we now know is the bad gut bacteria actually control your behaviour. They can secrete hormones, they can make you feel irritable, they can make you feel hungry, and they can actually direct you specifically to eat starch. Um, so by, by killing them off by eating the soluble fibre, you get rid of all those bad gut bacteria, which is not just good from a weight perspective, but also it turns out those bad gut bacteria also are the major ones that make endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide, which is the most inflammatory molecule inside the gut. And so that is the molecule we think stirs up the immune system. And again, Toby uh, mentioned it himself in his talk. This is a really bad molecule, and it's produced by the bad gut bacteria. So by getting rid of them and replacing them with the good gut bacteria, um, we reduce the level of inflammation in the gut. And that reduces the overall level of inflammation in the body. So that, that's the explanation for the benefits of soluble fibre. Uh, at the same time, um, you treat, you know, your problems of constipation, if, um, which is a side benefit because you can reduce your, your risk of, of bowel cancer. Uh, you improve your absorption of things like calcium and vitamin D. So, so again, this has, has positive effects in terms of better supply of vitamins through the bowel wall, but you have less uh, inflammation. And interestingly, the, the, the veterinary industry, who, you know, are into making healthy cows and healthy pigs to make money, uh, have known about this for much longer than the human physicians because they've been feeding inulin, uh, buying inulin and feeding it to their animals and publishing scientific papers on the benefits of this in terms of healthier animals, bigger animals, fitter animals uh, for the last 20 or 30 years. So it's ironic here that it's taken human physicians so long to learn about the benefits of soluble fibre and changing the gut balance in, in, in of bacteria, whereas, as I say, the, the farm producers have known about this clearly for much longer than we have. Um, so there have been a number of trials done uh, looking at either feeding uh, soluble inulin or, or fibre um, to people uh, to regulate immune function, uh, or feeding them probiotics, which are the, the yoghurt-type organisms, or both. And obviously both is good because one lives off the other and, and one supports the other. Um, and so there's a lot of, of data in, in animal models where you can show that feeding these things actually helps uh, switch off the inflammatory process and switches off type 1 diabetes in the animal models. The question then is what happens in humans? So fortunately, because this data wasn't published at the time I agreed to do the talk and was putting it together, uh, it was just recently published, this is a large study uh, done in babies, so it's the TEDDY study. Uh, it was done in multiple countries around the world, uh, particularly uh, the US, um, Finland, because of their high incidence, they're always looking for, for something to, to help their children, Germany and Sweden. And so what they did um, was they looked at the effect of giving probiotics or probiotic exposure in newborn babies at their risks, and in this case, what they were looking at is the development of those autoantibodies that I showed you before that appear many years before the children get type 1 diabetes. So, so if you can stop those autoantibodies, you should be a, it is subsequently able to see that you've stopped type 1 diabetes. So what did they find? So what they found is that children who were, were basically given probiotics by their parents um, uh, uh, within the first 27 days of age um, had the lowest rate of progression to get these antibodies. And the, the later in life that the children received expo their first exposure to probiotics, the faster and the more frequently they developed the autoantibodies to the beta cells. Um, so, so this is very clear preliminary evidence, and again, this is like 10,000 children they've now followed for 10 years. They're going to have to follow them for another 10, 20 years before they'll start to see, has this really switched off type 1 diabetes in, in the children who haven't developed the antibodies? But what we know from the science is that if they've switched off the antibodies, 
this ultimately should be switching off type 1 diabetes in these children. Um, so I think it's quite remarkable data. I mean, it's very exciting data. And, and this is not some toxic drug that we're having to give these children. It's basically exposing them to yoghurt or Yukult or, or probiotics and soluble fibre um, as babies. In fact, you could argue that that's what we should have been doing all along. That's a healthy diet. And in maybe in, in many ways, that's recreating breast milk. Because what we now know about breast milk is breast milk is not sterile. I know in the old days they talked about sterilising everything. In fact, breast milk is full of probiotics. So, so breast milk is full of bacteria. Um, and, uh, and so by sterilising even breast milk, you're actually doing the baby a disservice. And that's probably why we're now having to tell the mothers to give the children supplemental probiotics is because we're, at the same time we've convinced them that you know, breast, mil breast milk wasn't sterile and wasn't good for the baby. So, so we're, we're having to rethink everything. But it all starts to make sense. No, so, so, so there was a mix. Um, and, and in this it was the, the time of first exposure to supplemental probiotics either as a tablet, like, like you can buy, you know, um, those different probiotic capsules, or as, as yoghurt or, or you could. And of course, as I, was, I just got a few slides to go, what, in, interestingly, they, they looked at what, what were the factors in the mothers um, and the children that determined whether or not they gave them um, probiotics which was quite interesting. And what you see is basically you're best not to be born to a young mother um, because the lowest uh, rate of mothers giving the probiotics was in the women under 24 years of age, whereas women over that age were more concerned, were more educated and more likely to give their, their children probiotics. Um, uh, and, uh, and similarly, as, as you might guess, the women who were smokers were again the ones who probably paid the least attention to their children's health and gave, were the ones who gave them the lowest risk of probiotics. So this sort of identified good mothers as being the ones who gave the probiotics and maybe the not so good mothers were the ones not giving the probiotics. Um, so, so I think, you know, this is, is, is obviously incredibly exciting. Um, it sort of fits with, there's a certain logic to it, um, and the beauty is it's a non-toxic thing we can all do, um, and encouraging healthy eating is, is, is self-obvious. Um, it's the first place to start when you're looking for good health is, is healthy eating, and not healthy eating in adults. We need to talk about what's healthy eating for a newborn baby forward. Um, and that probably isn't, um, you know, uh, artificial formula. Um, and it probably isn't giving sterile, sterile foods. It's actually exposing um, babies to good gut bacteria. Um, so hopefully I've, 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 I've given you some interesting insights tonight in the fact that diet is important, I think, for prevention of type 1 diabetes as well as treatment of both type 1 and type 2 that maternal and early neonatal factors are, are almost certainly going to be critical to understanding how to switch off type 1 diabetes. It really needs to be done very early in life, probably within the first month of life. Uh, we have this emerging evidence that there's a very close link between dietary fibre intake and early probiotic exposure uh, to protection of at-risk children from autoimmune diabetes, let alone multiple sclerosis or all these other autoimmune conditions because, you know, this was the, the area the study was done, but that's not to say it probably will have impacts on, on other autoimmune diseases. Obviously, the Western diet, when people say, why have we got this explosion in type 1 diabetes in the last 50 years? Well, probably one explanation could be that our diet's got worse and worse over the last 50 years, particularly as we've moved to sterile food, um, one would argue. Um, and, uh, and obviously, the, the lack of, of fibre, because if we don't have enough of this soluble fibre, we won't have enough of the good gut bacteria. And so the vegetables, you know, that our grandparents were eating were also helping to sustain these um, bacteria. As I say now, if you don't like vegetables, you can actually take it as a, as a drink or, or a soluble fibre. But either way, we need more fibre 
of this kind in our diet. We're not talking about bran here. We're talking about soluble fibre. Um, and uh, as I say, even if it can't stop all children with type 1 diabetes uh, getting type 1 diabetes, it certainly will stop them having problems with getting constipated. Um, and uh, that should translate, and their trials been done showing that that will translate to reduced risk of bowel cancer later in life. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>